Well, he's wearing a suit. Hello. Okay, uh, good evening. I'd like to call the uh, January 13th, 2015 Sherman School Committee meeting to order at 6.30. Um, one note on the agenda is that we have an addition of an executive session to discuss safety at the end of this meeting, not to return to open session. It was um, as a result of a meeting that the superintendent had with safety officials yesterday, so we not, did not have time to post it, but he wants to uh, review things with the committee. So that'll be one addition to the agenda. So we start off with the state of the district, and we first of all start off with the CSA report. Mr. Embry? Good evening, school committee, uh, members of the community, and uh, special guests. Happy New Year on behalf of the CSA. Uh, this past weekend, we held uh, successfully held our third annual uh, CSA pancake breakfast, and I've learned since that the leftover pancakes were enjoyed in a surprise lunch today by the kids, so that's great. So, um, a little extra side order. Yeah. Uh, so again, it's uh, thanks to the support of everyone who was able to attend. Uh, it was a, a success, even with the cold. Uh, second item, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Sherborne Business Association. Uh, Association, we were uh, awarded two separate grants that went to uh, enrichment programming. Uh, thanks to Ann Whitlock and Carrie Tony for helping to secure the grants, which will be applied to Ball in the House, which will be a uh, school-wide. I think it's an acapella program uh, for an upcoming all school meeting and for our Dare Keeping It Real program, which has already begun for the fifth graders. So it's, uh, we're proud to uh, receive uh, funds from the Business Association again. So uh, it's great. Finally, the uh, Pine Hill CSA auction will be Saturday, May 2nd, from 5.30 to 10.30 at Pine Hill. And for those of you familiar with the auction, may I note that the start time is a little bit earlier than traditionally done, and this is to accommodate streaming of the uh, Kentucky Derby. So anyone that's, maybe it's too early in the year for everyone to have horse racing on the brain, but uh, that'll be the, the theme of this year's auction. So uh, look for more information to be coming out over the next month or so for Items related to the auction. That's all for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. And my, my grandson and I enjoyed your pancake breakfast. Uh, right before I went to Boy Scouts, it worked out just fine. Thank Great. You. It's good to hear. Okay, Dr. Brown, do you have a report for us? Um, yes, we met uh, just a couple weeks ago, instructionally speaking. Uh, for our December meeting. So my report is uh, briefer than usual, uh, but I would like to specifically recognize, uh, uh, thank you to Officer Chad Smith, who is the newest member of the Sherburn Police Department and who now serves as our DARE slash Keeping It Real, which is the name of the revised curriculum. Our fifth graders had their first session last week. Tomorrow will be the second session. Uh, the D.A.R.E. curriculum is now 10 weeks. It, it formerly was eight weeks, and uh, it's been revised uh, with uh, research-based uh, strategies. So uh, we're off and running with, with that. Uh, we are approaching halfway day, which is a big deal at the elementary school. Halfway day and 100th day are... Um, big mathematical celebrations in our curriculum, don't you know? So, uh, uh, our brain busters who've been mentioned many a time in this forum, uh, but congratulations to our brain busters uh, team members Ryan Bendrimer, Owen Bingham, Dylan Natal, Nate Randa, Sam Randa, and Zachary Zito. They, uh, since our last meeting, they went to the state competition where they placed third. Uh, and are, we're very excited. Um, I'll remember to send you the link. They made a video trailer, like a movie trailer, of their experience. And we showed it at last Friday's All School Meeting. It has a, a very powerful Star Wars theme. And it was, it, was, it was a hoot and a holler. I'll send you the link. Uh, I was going to mention the great success of the pancake breakfast, but we touched upon that. But always a nice, always a nice community event. 
Uh, something from professional development that I wanted to highlight in addition to the ongoing uh, professional development with our literacy consultants, uh, two of our teachers have taken the initiative to sign on to be trained uh, in a tech collaborative forum that's new. Uh, being newly offered this year, a Teachers as lead Leaders Forum. And Anna Martinetti and Jen Ryan uh, attended their first session last Friday with rave reviews. And they've already come back and um, have eagerly met with me uh, ways that we can continue to perpetuate growing our school culture and empowering um, and energizing our staff members. So I wanted to make special mention uh, with regard to, um, to their, their leadership. Um, our second semester uh, community classes uh, through, through community education, uh, through Box, and through Glo Global Child are in the process of being enrolled. I wanted to make mention that we have 39 students that have been in the Box program every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 7.30 a.m. They faithfully show up, and uh, it's, it continues to be um, a very robust part of our early morning um, offerings for students and and that's a tribute to uh, to all of the coaches and the families who support the program so thank you uh, you'll notice in my agenda I included what I uh, intended to be an organized visual representation of the scheduling expectations for students across the grade levels we've touched upon this topic on on you know at many previous meetings and we have lots of information in many different formats and I, I hope that this is uh, brings just visual clarity in, in a uh, one one stop shopping here to give you a sense of the special subjects allocations the uh, core subject allocations and uh, some of the uh, enrichment subjects such as such as with our FLESS program by grade level so um, in the context of our budget and staffing discussions I'm, I'm hoping this will be helpful you know, it would also be helpful um, you know at some point in the future to put a summary of something like the percentage because I'm you know this is really good information because this is what we're talking about trying to get a handle on like the, the full full day and if you just did like a you know total minutes percentage type thing that would help at least help me get an idea of what we're talking about when we say you know twice a week you know we're gonna do this or twice a week we'd like to do that you know something that puts it in, in the whole context. I don't, not to give you extra mm -hmm. work, but so you know what you, I'm saying? Did you want to look at the, um, <clears throat> like the instructional day to, to calculate how many minutes of instruction students receive? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, just percent, you know, something, you know, with percentages, only because we've been talking a lot about how do we cram more into the school day. Right. We're, we're already, you know, basically cramming stuff in. And this is really good information. And if it just had like a, a summary, you know, and hmm? how long is how long yeah, is like today? Total, you know, it's, minutes and percentage, you know, just how, how the instructional day is uh, is six hours and twenty five minutes from from arrival to dismissal, uh, excluding weeks when we have an early release Wednesday. Uh, as you can imagine, there's you know a fair amount of transition time as students go from class to class or you know, arrive first thing in the morning and we take attendance and, you know, all morning announcements and those kinds of things. Right. So I, I agree with Susan in that to sort of know what the, the actual instruction time is, for instance, with uh, Spanish is going uh, into the second grade mm -hmm. next year, mm -hmm. right? So to have a sense of <clears throat> we have six hours and 25 minutes, I don't know how much transitional time that is, but as you said, it's probably a lot. So where is that? instructional time for the second grade where's that coming from you know to know where that's mm -hmm. coming from i think we'll be able to do a visual by grade we could probably just chunk out kindergarten and and tabulate that you know 20 percent or 25 percent of the day is dedicated to ela maybe 20 yeah. percent to mathematics and just sort of i'm, I'm visualizing <coughs> something that's just by grade level a pretty simple spreadsheet color codified excellent uh, i think it's it'll be yep. a good visual for the committee to see 
and what kind of falls out of the day and right, goes right. into the day. Right. <clears throat> and that would help us to then also see when those potential availabilities are, you know, how much mm -hmm. there is for some of these other okay. things, yeah. you know, right. that are listed on this other table, which, you know, says right. at a certain time per week, but it doesn't say how much time that is. So right. how does that work as, yeah. well, as well? Mm -hmm. So that sure. if you did want to do something else, you know. What's the time cost of that yeah you know right. yeah. not to make a lot of extra work but yeah we won't yeah what well, if I just may add on though one one of the things that we're working hard to do around science and social studies is integrate cross-curricular so I always get squeamish because that's not necessarily standalone time for example uh, Dr. LaDuke was doing a walkthrough with me I believe it was last Thursday and we happened upon a particular fifth grade classroom it was readers workshop time uh, the kids were engaged in self-directed inquiry based on questions that they had about the science unit of study or the social studies unit of study, but they were read using reading skills uh, to research and uh, uh, respond so uh, so science and social studies as as perhaps you used to know it where they were standalone are really intended to be integrated at the elementary level so just keep that in mind as well but we'll provide that visual okay. in, in a similar vein I just want to mention I was in one of senior Romer's classes and um, it was about habitats and it was the same content that they were learning in the first grade they were learning it in Spanish so it was reinforcing many of the <coughs> content area skills that they were learning in science in another language and they were very adept at it so it's just she looks into what they're learning in class and incorporates that into her lessons and ditto with our library uh, our librarian but more often than not you'll see kids working on a science or social studies concept in library so but I'll but I'll, I'll footnote all of that so it's uh, it's clear thank you that's great and there's a lot of interest in the FLESS program just to remind uh, Sherborne School Committee that the Dover School Committee will join us in February and we will have a presentation because Dover School Committee does not meet in February. They don't have a scheduled meeting, but they would like to, to join your meeting if uh, the invitation exists <laughs> um, for a FLESS presentation. So we had a great uh, meeting this week with the two principals, uh, myself and Dr. LaDuke, to begin thinking about that. And the FLESS program will look a little bit different next year, you know, because the, the teachers that we have, there'll be one teacher in each school because now we're rolling up a number of sections so we're really administratively trying to preserve and protect the the fidelity of the program to make sure those teachers have time uh, so that they can continue with the curriculum development work mm -hmm. we would not want for them to become sort of teachers assigned to a particular district uh, they've worked famously well together uh, Patricia Chilwanga and Laura Romer uh, so we want to make sure we preserve and protect that relationship that accurate dr. Brown it is and just as a caveat um, uh, I b you'll meet Patricia for the first time and and um, we anticipate that she'll be part of our staffing pattern next year at Pine Hill School so um, we'll make official introductions to you next month All right, thank Great. You. You have a question? Uh, one more question <coughs> it'd also be helpful to know if it's possible to, to know if kids need extra help in certain areas where that comes from you know if, mm -hmm. if there's a priority in terms of what they don't do that's on the on on this list just if that's if that's possible mm -hmm. okay um, mr. bliss you have a sent off <coughs> report I sure do um, one thing we'd like to provide the Sherborne School Committee and just to dovetail on that as well you also in your packet had a memo from dr. Brown to me dated January 7th which was further uh, detailing the instructional day right. so I just want to make sure you, you saw that <coughs> it went beyond what was in Dr. Brown's already sol solid report. Um, we'd like to update the mm -hmm. Sherborne School Committee in providing a draft of the uh, the business manager search process timeline. Uh, this will be discussed um, among the business manager task force members, uh, but this so it's <coughs> heavily stamped draft here. But we want to make sure that we're you know being transparent and uh, and completely out there in terms of what our our process kind of looks like because it really will kick off in February. Uh, so before we next meet as a group, uh, we just want to make sure that you're not hearing things, seeing things, and thinking, you know, why wasn't this discussed at the committee level? So um, we will hopefully don't have to go around, and there are a few over here. I'll take a look at that. It's really, um, and, ag and again, the business manager task force uh, on which Mr. Garland is a representative uh, meets on Thursday morning of this week. So. There may well be some changes uh, to this after the task force uh, committee looks looks at this a little bit. 
Is that accurate, Mr. Gallon? Uh, yes. Spot on. So you can see it, it walks you through. It's a little bit of uh, backwards design here. We know we would look for a July 1st start date of the business manager um, and April 13th. Uh, we, we backed into that date because April 13th is a joint school committee meeting and because the business manager is a school committee appointment, we thought it would make sense to back the whole process up and to make sure that um, that would work for us. And we're happy that uh, Chris Tague will be able to join us this Thursday morning at the business manager task force meeting because we really need um, to talk to Chris to learn a little bit more of the intricacies of the business office and um, pick a brain a little bit. So we're happy that she's able to, to join us for that meeting. So that's really for informational purposes there. In terms of other items in the report, I will share with Sherborne School Committee that the school start times survey data will be released publicly tomorrow uh, over the weekend. I, I wrote a, a two-page cover letter that will go out to um, all of the, the school start times committee members. Mr. Hook is a member of that committee, um, has had the data. Uh, but it's been embargoed for, for a few weeks. So we put together a cover letter and that will be made public uh, tomorrow. So you'll see five sets of respondent data uh, from elementary educators, regional educators, um, and regional parents, elementary parents, and secondary students. You'll be able to see the complete um, reports from SurveyMonkey around that with a, with a two-page cover letter. So. Um, that's exciting to look forward to that. As Mr. Hess referenced, we had a school security meeting yesterday. We just want to make public that we had that meeting um, so that uh, members of the viewing public know that we'll be going to executive session hopefully tonight uh, to discuss some of the outcomes of that meeting. As well, we'll talk a little bit, I think, on the subcommittee report under uh, capital a little bit in the building and capital committee. We've included in your packet information about the DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, flexibility waiver renewal. And we really just wanted to include that for you because the Commonwealth of Massachusetts a couple of years ago was granted a waiver from the No Child Left Behind Act that allowed the Commonwealth to track the annual progress of its public schools a little bit differently um, than is the case in some of the other states. And it has really worked well for, for us as a relatively high performing school district in terms of how the schools are ranked on a one through five system. And it allows a little more flexibility in terms of Title I and Title II grant allocation. So we've included a little bit of information for you. And we have no reason to believe that the Commonwealth's waiver wouldn't be renewed. Um, and we, we hope that it is, but it's something that the Department of Ed is, is taking care of for us. So <coughs> we just wanted you to have information around that. Uh, Dr. Brown mentioned the Brain Busters, and again, just a kudo, kudos to our, our Brain Busters and their, and their placement as well uh, a few weeks ago. The Educator Evaluation System, um, a lot of very exciting things happening, and um, I think it would probably be a, a better venue maybe at the joint meeting in February to go into a little more detail around the Ed Eval System. We have the qualified peer observer component that you heard a little bit about uh, through the ACD update, but we also are looking at to roll out the feedback component of, um, of that system. So some very large components of the evaluation system that we're looking to be very thoughtful about rolling out. And again, we thank Mr. Hook for his continued membership on this four-year-old <laughs> committee. I think we're going on four years, Mr. Hook. Wow, can you believe or something it? on that. That committee has been alive <coughs> and well, and we still meet faithfully. And I think we're going to have a little mini meeting yes. next week. So I'll get there as soon as I can. <laughs> oh, no, I know. <laughs> no, please, please don't rush. Um, <laughs> we will wait for you. Um, the edu uh, Education Week ranks Massachusetts first in the nation. We provide a link uh, for you uh, on, on that article there. And the regional school uh, schools news, just wanted to also make public the fact that we, uh, at the middle school where we have our regional school committee meetings and our joint school committee meetings, we have installed a hearing assistive system as well um, that was just installed. So we want to make the public aware um, that at the meetings held at um, at the middle school library will be able to facilitate that need should uh, attendees need that. And also the fact that Dr. and Mrs. Mudge, we were honored uh, that Dr. and Mrs. Mudge were able to attend uh, with their son Andrew, able to attend the opening night of Annie 
Uh, last month, it was a very special night for the family. And of course, the Mudges have been most generous in, uh, in support of the arts, of the DS Arts program uh, that has, in recent history, extended beyond just the Mudge Auditorium at Linquist Commons. But you'll recall that the Mudges have also donated money uh, for some work that's been done in the, the Pine Hill Auditorium as well. So um, it was really a, a very special night for, for them and for us. The Chemical Health Night, uh, another plug for that coming up on March 9th. And uh, as well, there was a very nice piece in December 21st, Boston Globe, on uh, very successful boosters organizations in Metro West. Um, so you can see our picture there. It was, it was like one of those blowing rainy days. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Driving rain. But you wouldn't know it um, necessarily by looking at the picture. You still look good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Internet Safety Night uh, coming up mid-February as well. And the exciting news from Chickering School is that we will have an integrated preschool program uh, in Dover, beginning with one classroom next year. So that's been cooking. Uh, it's been in, in, the brain, in the brain box for a while. And uh, we have embedded that in our fiscal 16 budget. And uh, so we're pretty excited to roll that program out next year as well. What, do, what does that mean, integrated? Um, Just like we have, you know how we have the preschool program at Pine Hill? We will have the same program at, okay. at Dover, Chickering, beginning next year. We have two classrooms. We'll have one in Dover to start the program. Yes, Ann? Um, maybe just to put on the list of things to talk about, when you talk about the DDMs, I'd be curious to see how, because um, I know that they're doing pre-tests and post-tests to help with the, ass the assessments to you as it says, to sure. measure educator effectiveness, and then how that's also being used with the students, i.e., when they get 100 on the pretest or do 95, whatever, then what? Right. Um, I think that that's something worth discussing. Sure, we can pro absolutely provide some feedback. And the DDM rollout at the state level, um, you know, I think the, the, the DESE is still wondering how, how this is all going to roll out. Our implementation of the DDMs, where we still continue to be sort of ahead of the curve, a lot of districts you ask, I actually was having a conversation with a, with a superintendent a couple weeks ago in a, in a very high-performing district who said, we're, we're just at a stalemate with our evaluation system, and we don't have an evaluation system that we're using, I mean, a system uh, that we're actually using at the moment. So. Uh, I think we continue to be a little bit ahead of the curve, but that is not to suggest at all that we have this uh, finely tuned. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress. And it, timely, you should ask the question, Anne, because we've been having administrator mid-cycle meetings and talking a little bit about goal setting for next year. And really, we, we feel collectively like we need to really invest a lot more time in the evaluation system. Um, because it, it feels a little bit like it's catch as catch can for some components of it and we just do not want a couple years down the road to be thinking well if we had only rolled this out differently or that out did, you know we want to be extremely thoughtful about it um, in much the same way we have been for four years so <coughs> and just make sure that we keep in mind and I know that it's part of it but sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the administrative side of it make sure yeah. that it's about the kids absolutely well that's the that's the whole like yeah. the feedback component that we're ready to roll out is going to be a critical I, aspect be, of, yeah. of the system we don't want it to be sort of like an afterthought or something we're doing to catch yeah. up you know yeah. and I have had um, some conversations with the curriculum leaders department heads and, and the building principals about some of the assessments and is this the right tool to measure student growth Mm -hmm. And pre and post tests did come up, and you know how how do we effectively use that information for next steps? Um, so we're we're tweaking them and refining them and reflecting on what's in place and should that be this assessment that goes forward? So great conversations. So, yeah. So I'd love to if, like if this is sort of the conversation that we're going to have at some point down the line. I'd love to hear more. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was it for my component, Dr. Ladue. I wanted to update the committee and the community about the wellness initiatives that are happening in the district. We'll have our full wellness committee. We'll have our full wellness committee meet on um, January 26th to discuss the, product, the progress in the area of food service, the wellness policy, and the stress and anxiety subgroup. The food, poli food service subgroup met on December 8th. Um, Mr. John Ledwick from Edwocate shared the report, um, highlighting first and foremost the quality of the staff we have in place and the quality of um, some of the food that's served. So I thought that was important for me to share. But also looking at the need to create a strategic vision, to look at financial models, um, to look at a, um, some of the uh, 
uh, equipment needs and facilities needs and you'll see later on Mr. Bliss will share with you a point of sale system that needs to be upgraded so that'll be shared later um, in the um, report but there's a food service action plan that Ms. Madden has developed in the three areas of staff training marketing and menu selection and presentation. Um, Ms. Tag and I have worked with Ms. Ma Ms. Madden on that food service action plan. She has some training for her staff scheduled for February 4th. She's done some professional development for them, looking at some of the um, evaluations that are happening there. In addition, the wellness policy subgroup met on October 6th and November 17th to look at the implementation guidelines in the areas of physical activity, nutrition, and social and emotional health. Um, but we, they were apprised of the fact that the draft policy was sent back to the subcommittee um, and we'll meet in late January to look at that policy again. And you've heard a lot about the Challenge Success Initiative, the Stress and Anxiety subgroup met on December 4th to debrief that. And just of note, on February 10th, Dr. Brown? If that's a Tuesday. Yeah, if that's a Tuesday. Yes. I like that. We think that way. Um, there will be a training for all of our elementary educators at Chickering combined Pine Hill and Chickering on challenge success. And then what does that mean and what are the next steps for the elementary in that program? Um, a great training was held this past week right. at Last the region mm -hmm. to, to share um, some of the survey data from students uh, as it is associated with the challenge success. So that's the wellness update. And if I may insert, uh, I don't want to mention the date because I'm not sure if it's been absolutely confirmed, uh, but the last week in February we anticipate holding uh, a parent forum uh, with the challenge success coaches uh, in addition with our staff um, an evening forum for parents I actually heard from a from a Pine Hill Pine Hill and middle school parent now as she has a child at the middle school as well this week and she was really thrilled to see so much more system-wide kind of effort around particularly this topic but more globally on, on a lot of topics both in terms of the student wellness as well as curricularly and uh, she was really impressed to see that there's such a concerted effort to make sure that the CSP program, the Challenge Success Program, plugs in uh, to our elementary schools. And uh, Dr. Brown, thank you for attending. Our Stanford, our coach from Stanford University was out last week um, to meet with the middle school and high school faculty. So she was at the Mudge Auditorium and Dr. Brown and Dr. LaDuke were both there um, as well just to, uh, for Dr. Brown to, I think, to garner a sense of how does this logically plug in for our Pine Hill students, where, when, and how, and for our faculty mm -hmm. and staff. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. The, uh, Ms. Green. Ms. Ms. Green, are you next up here? I need to, I believe that I am. Thank you. Um, so at the last meeting, we were asked to, to take a look at um, per pupil cost for special education, the trends over the last several years. So in your package, you have this data that Chris Tag um, helped us put together for the last few years comparing costs over the years and the trends up and down for that cost um, and we adjusted the number that's projected for 2015-16 school year the number that was included in your packet last time projected a number of 41 where that number came from we're simply taking the current number of students and subtracting out the students that we know are in fifth grade and will move to the middle school with no adjustment for what we looked at in trends each year for the number of new students coming into special education. So what we did do is we sat and we took a look at the special education numbers from the last few years and where we were ending at the end of a school year and starting at the at the next the beginning of the next school year or November or so of the next school year and we took sort of an average of what that number looks like so when you look at um, this enrollment form you know for example in the 2011-12 school year I believe was the year we sent a very very large number of fifth grade students to the middle school that year and despite that fact in 2011-12 we had 67 students in the next year 61 so that was our largest class of fifth graders that we sent so the trend we looked at the trends each year the number of students that were moving to fifth grade and averaged out how many students are coming into the program in, in a year so we had given you a number of 41 interestingly if I were to take today's numbers 
without factoring in for any new students being identified, we are at 45 as of today. So those numbers are a constant change. Um, and so we are at 45 at this point. And what we did was we took a look at the trends in an average in a school year of students coming in um, to preschool or students moving into town, <laughs> new students identified as eligible, and it was an average of about 10 students per year. So we have adjusted that for an estimate of 55 students next year. And we based this chart and the per pupil cost on an estimate, best guess estimate, based on trends. So if I could jump in there for one moment, if if you were to look at your if you were to look at your staffing enrollment report that we handed out some documents for you um, and that were they were included in the packet uh, for you tonight, there's a revised staffing enrollment report included, and it's a word table. And you may wonder uh, where when we built this spreadsheet over the past couple of weeks, where where my finger is, where did all of these numbers come from, special ed enrollment numbers. And these numbers were lifted exactly from what these numbers were in the staffing enrollment report for each year. So, for instance, in the 12-13, the 12-13 school year, uh, the number of 61 special education students was taken right from this report. So that you could take this snapshot, and we extracted literally this segment of the budget that captures all of the in-district special ed and rela education-related costs and calculated a per pupil expenditure roughly which is never something that we're necessarily comfortable doing because it isn't as if there's a direct correlation it's not as if in the 13 14 school year it cost twenty thousand eight hundred thirty five dollars per every one of the 59 students who is a special ed student because not only is that fictitious in terms of the service delivery for a particular student but the number itself of 59 was an absolute snapshot in time. I mean, that could have been 59. We Again, we took it from the staffing and report, so it would be a little bit of apples and apples. But 59 at that particular point when that number was captured could have been 58, 52, 62, depending <coughs> on what time you take. And there's often a lot of anxiety that people experience, school community members sometimes experience, and we do too, around when we look at some of the data that's captured by the DESE, by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, they can go in at any point seamlessly and through the expanded SIMS reporting mechanism now, at any point they could go in at 1 o'clock tomorrow morning and capture electronically the numbers of kids who are on IEPs. So they may capture that number tomorrow on January 14th, and then at the end of this week, we could have three kids that roll off IEPs and next week two that roll on to IEPs. And that won't, the, the numbers are not going to jive with, because it is literally that, that fluid uh, in terms of when the numbers. So we were, and we think the request from the school, from the Sherborne School Committee <coughs> came from the angle of, you know, po aggregate population at, at Pine Hill is down. We know that. Um, if in fact, as, as a, pre, a previous report of the staffing report, ro, enrollment report reflected a special ed enrollment of 41 for next year, that was like a raw number. I mean, that was 41 without any consideration around um, kids and our average number of kids. So we looked over the past few years at May and June, and okay, the fifth graders are moving to the middle school, and then ultimately by sometime the following school year, where do we land? It's almost to the child have those cases been, the IEP cases been, as it were, replaced. You can see that because the numbers were 67, 61, 59, 61. So when we did this out, we said, wow, if we put down 41 students, which is just the, the raw number, it doesn't matter what it does to the per pupil expenditure. It's not really an accurate number in terms of where we're going to land next year. We know that. History tells us that. So I would also just like to remind the Sherbourne School Committee that um, we in the past few years have had absolutely no elementary age students out of district placed. We operate Pine Hill Elementary School with four special educators, four. That it is true that the special ed enrollment is, uh, has declined uh, by, a pro by I think it's about 17.84 or something, 17.84% uh, over the past couple of years. Um, and what we have done, we've actually reduced an educational assistant, we've reduced a special educator, and we've reduced 20% of a special service provider. And we operate the elementary school with four, four special ed teachers, servicing a population of this year 
about 61 next year. We estimate 55 students. That's not that's not out of line with with the percentage of special ed students in the school. We're always we always float between 14 and 17 percent of the, the student population. That's average for schools. And I'll also remind Sherman School Committee that I attended an Accept Board of Directors meeting a few weeks ago. And at the very end, it was like an open mic session. It's a public meeting, so I'm not sharing anything. And almost every single superintendent sitting around the table said that he or she would be going back to their fin his or her respective FinCom in the next few months to ask for between four hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars of additional appropriation because of just exorbitant special ed costs that they're incurring. So there was this kind of, what are people doing, you know, around who's developing what programs and and what are you what are you doing? So. We have tried to be responsive. We've tried to, to provide as much data as we can. It is sometimes difficult to tie numbers exactly out for the reasons that Ms. Green alludes to and that we've shared. Um, we've done the best that we can to show the picture that these aren't wildly, these aren't wildly fluctuating costs and we're actually pretty thinly staffed on the special ed side in-house as far as that's concerned. I don't know if, there's, if there is a desire among school committee members to, to dive more deeply into these numbers. It probably would be, it, we would welcome you, to, you know, let's schedule a meeting and come into the central office. We can kind of look at different points. I'm not sure that doing that here necessarily will, will accomplish that goal, but we, we were trying to be responsive to the school committee's requests. Thank you. Any Thank you. questions from the committee? I have a great right. few. <coughs> so on the new staffing enrollment analysis for 2014-15 special education enrollment it says 61 right and on the back it says students as of November 2014 is 50 and I think you just said that right now it's 45 the 41 wasn't correct because right now it's 45 45 Terry so it project the, 45 projected for six fiscal year 16. That doesn't well, include so the fifth graders, the 45. That that number. So when you saw 41 in that column for 15, I'm not asking 16. About, I'm not asking okay, about 41. I'm wondering. So the 2014-15 that's on this, it says 61, right? Yes. Right. So on the back, it says students as of in the for the double asterisk students as of November 2014 it says 50 what's the difference between 61 and 50 and I think yeah, I'm getting this mixed up I think you, you said like right now it's it's 40 it's 45 that would imply so students as of November 2014 was 50 it's dropped by five but what's the difference between the 50 and the 61 so I think actually what that should say is projected number of students as of November 2014. That is not the current number as of November 2014. That's the, that's how, oh, I'm sorry, that's, I'm yeah. sorry. Well, so, I mean, we can say it for later, but it just seems like there's a lot, and I understand that it changes. The other thing that was confusing is on, in our budget book, we got the special ed, census and that says October 2014 that adds up to 48 pre-k through fifth grade adds up to 48 so so this is what's confusing right. for me that's October 2014 it says 48 this chart says 61 and on the back the six it says 50 I, and, and then when I look at the prior year, the October, and I, let me just say, I appreciate all this information, and mm -hmm. it's much better than what we've had in the past. Right. And unfortunately, kind of like in my business, the more information you give, the more questions people can ask. That's so, what we're realizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate it. And the reason it's important is because the numbers are so large. Right. 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 Um, and I've tried to reconcile it before. So I see there's there's a, a, a 48. That's of, as of October. I don't know what the 61 refers to in terms of time frame, but then I go back a year, and the, the difference between October 2013 and June 2014 is, is four students. It goes from, 50, from 57 to, to 61, which is easily done. So in terms of the volatility, so just where those, what, 
what's what the numbers you know which one's the right number and why it's so different between the 61 and the and the 50 or the 61 and the 48 um, and then the it, one, one last question is in the special ed census or and you may not have this in front of you but it says uh, pre-k in June of 2014 had 10 students and I'm assuming that pre-K becomes K the next year. The next that, year. That's, excuse me, that's not a correct assumption. Yeah. Our students in pre-K are three years old, four years old, okay. uh, and so five years stay. old. Okay. They can stay up to three years in a pre-K So the, it goes from 10 to, 10 to 2. two. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, that clarifies that. So the, the, 61 and the, the 61 and the 48 and the, and the 50 is what's confusing to me. Okay. Do you, um, Terry, do we want to take that under advisement and we can respond? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask a really Susan? basic question? IEPs, are they all different lengths? Is that why um, the, 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 like, I mean, how long they, an IEP yeah, I mean, they is written be, for? Yeah. Every IEP can, has to be um, rewritten annually, so they're only good for one year, calendar year. So if we were to hold a meeting on January 13th of 2015, we have to reconvene the team and hold an annual review to rewrite that IEP before January 13th of 2016. Okay, so they're a year long then, standard? Like standard they're year? a year long, oh, but yeah. everyone is on a different uh, interval. Yes. Okay, in so that's when their why. Annual review is. Okay. So, so that's it's, where the numbers it's are going always right stagnant, and um, as Mr. Bliss said, we're discharging students who no longer need service and identifying students. Um, and I think what's tricky, I obviously my focus is the K five portion of our public school enrollment, and I'm positive we started the school year with IEPs in the in the uh, 50s, not in the 40s, uh, in terms of in terms of numbers. So we'll. Um, so that number of 61 resonates as the at the beginning of this year at some point the beginning of this year September October uh, perhaps would, with yeah. preschool and yeah with yeah. preschool so, included yeah. yeah yeah and I know it's tricky um, you know because we tuition some some children in from uh, Dover so depending on how we pull, pull up our numbers sometimes they show up in our Sherburn numbers and we mm -hmm. intend for this to be pure exactly. so exactly. they don't show up in your numbers yeah. uh, but sometimes so what, they do. 61 be it could be inclusive of Dover numbers so we want to make sure that's why we'll provide a response after after the meeting if that's okay with the committee we just want to go through child by child and make sure that you know. hey uh, thank you uh, thank Jake, you, Mr. you have a for us you have a status of appropriations however there was no um, report as a result of just the timing between the last meeting and the holiday break and we're back only two weeks um, Nothing's really changed, though, as I reported out from the previous month. Nothing remarkable at this time. Um, one, one thing I would like to highlight with the, with the new um, administration, the new governor, um, he actually has until March 4th to produce a budget because it's a new administration. So that may delay as far as information as concerning state aid, et cetera. And if you have any questions, are there any for those nine C cuts Could be. pending? Or? I think we're we're still waiting to hear um, from the governor. And, and what would be the impact to us? Would it go directly to us? Would it be the town? How how would that work? So there's a, the big debate right now seems to be, and we were supposed to hear something actually last week, but um, when we reported last week to the regional school committee. You know, it's, it's interesting because one of the potential cuts is to uh, regional transportation. Effectively, it's, it's three areas that could affect uh, public education. It could be Chapter 78, uh, could be Chapter 71 aid. Chapter 71 is regional transportation for regional school districts. So last Tuesday night when we met with the region, they were, you know, keenly interested in, in knowing what we knew of, of that. And uh, we're expecting any word anytime soon. But the Mass Association of Regional School uh, Committees, MARS, they go by, is, is, is actively looking at uh, some legislation that could potentially block the move of the governor to reduce regional transportation by anything greater than what's proposed to be reduced for local state aid. 
So we don't know numbers yet. I mean, we just it's it's really in, in limbo land. What we do know has already been cut is uh, the MECO grant has been cut slightly. Uh, that has already impacted us. So our MECO grant has been cut by about $4,235. Um, so immediately that decimated the supply line uh, for the MECO program. So any, any monies that have been allocated for some conferences and supplies and whatnot, those are, those are off the table uh, for the rest of this year. So that letter came very quickly on the heels of the announcement. And if you watch the nightly news, local news, there's all kinds of conversation around what those cuts uh, you know, may look like, but we wouldn't even want to speculate. Uh, but it could affect this year. The, if I may add, uh, the only thing is under um, the legislation, they actually have to, the, the governor has, does not have the right to reduce um, through the 9C, reduce Chapter 70 or local aid. The legislature, from what I understand, has already has yeah. already voted not to, not to support that. They need they needed he needed their support. So I think that's positive. That is so. The governor, Governor Patrick, at the time had moved uh, to get that legislation through, so that there could be the authority could reside with the governor, and then um, that was that was blocked. Um, so that that has not come to pass. So what's sitting out there, very lo is looming out there, is this regional transportation issue, which is has some credence to it. There's actually a legal defense fund that's been created on the at the Mars level to. Um, a, obtain an opinion on, a, on some legislation that was passed years ago around whether or not the governor exceeded his authority at the time to actually invoke uh, those drastic reductions or proposed drastic reductions to Chapter 71. That's regional transportation. So that there, uh, Mars is seeking a legal opinion as to whether or not the governor actually had jurisdiction to to do that. There's a there's a law out there that says the governor shall never reduce Chapter 71 by anything greater than what Chapter 70 may be reduced by. So Chapter 70 was sitting here and it was like Droop! there was a proposal to drop 71. And that so that for the time being has been blocked for the time being. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, subcommittee updates. The only one listed here is the <coughs> Capital Budget Committee. And our request has not changed both the Pine Hill School Building Committee and the Sherburn School Committee they'll have their request at $200,550. And um, at this point in time, there's no change. We are, of course, having to work on those requests and what we need in each of those areas. And I just learned today that um, one of the requests for this soffit insulation, uh, we had a problem last year where some of the, the pipes in the ceiling in the hallway froze. Well, this year, I guess the alarm went off and they had to have someone come in and they have to run the, the heat on a daytime cycle at night and pop the ceiling tiles so the heat will go up in the ceiling and, and keep the pipes from freezing. So we're hoping that the work that we're going to do this coming warm season this summer will, uh, will take care of that problem. And the other thing we have to really look at, of course, is the drainage problem. That's, uh, you know, you get as many opinions as you have people on that, so we are continuing to, uh, to work on that. I actually, this morning, uh, Mr. Hess, I had a morning meeting with uh, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen from Sherborne with Mr. Jaimo, and we spent about an hour together uh, conversing about a few different topics. And uh, one of the topics we discussed, and it was largely in response to um, the concern that had been raised at the December 18th Sherborne Board of Selectmen meeting concerning school security. Uh, Selectman Dorensis had remarked that when he was looking over the capital requests from both the region and from Sherborne, uh, local from Pine Hill, that he, he didn't see a lot of you know security uh, mention in there. So I wanted to take the time to update uh, Chairman Jaimo on uh, some of the steps that this committee has, has moved in the direction of to ensure safety at, at Pine Hill School. And I also shared with uh, Chairman Jaimo some of the information concerning some recent decisions at the regional school committee level concerning some security enhancements to be uh, enacted on that campus as well. While I had his, his audience, uh, we chatted a bit about the uh, drainage issue. And he is wholly committed uh, to helping us solve this problem uh, in and around Pine Hill School. And he knows it's been a, it's been a long-standing issue, and he pledged his uh, his effort in the meeting coming up this Thursday to uh, not only mention in a in a general way 
that security um, is, is, is tight at Pine Hill, but also to speak to the fact that this committee has done a, its due diligence around the drainage issue and that that should really be supported. So um, it was an extremely productive meeting and we also covered the intermunicipal agreement issue uh, that touches the region. So we got a lot done. You get a lot done at 7 a.m., Mr. Garland. Um, so I just thank you, Mr. Hess. Okay, thank you. And um, next on the agenda is the uh, instructional leadership update as far as the, uh, the fine arts sure. position is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Hess. And um, <coughs> Judy Miller, you're here for a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Your dance card wasn't filled tonight. <laughs> so, um, we want to provide an update um, to the Sherborne School Committee. When we last met, and we've updated this memo, the original proposal was dated November 12th, 2014. There was a request from the Sherborne School Committee and others and, and, and then Chickering as well and the region to look at the cost allocation a little bit differently. There are actually two requests. One concerned the finances behind the position and the second uh, members on a couple of different committees sought greater explanation and this came from the region um, around the instructional underpinnings of the, of the position itself, the Fine Arts Department Chair position. So attached to this memo, uh, you will find a document that some of our fine arts teachers actually, they create a Google Doc, and I ask them, not that it would necessarily support the position, but if we were to have this position, what are some of the instructional values? I mean, what, what do you really see as uh, this person helping with? And they did an, a fantastic job of, in, in almost three pages, explaining some of the instructional underpinnings of this and of this posi proposed position. And while we were at it, uh, through the good work uh, that Dr. LaDuke is doing with uh, Teresa B. and me from, from Pine Hill, with Steve Hart, her counterpart at Chickering, um, and with the leadership team at Chickering and at Pine Hill, we actually want to provide a little bit of information around what computer science uh, looks like because that's also part of that the whole technology engineering piece I know that's a 6 through 12 proposal here but again this interest in articulating this K through 12 so we thought it would be it's enormously important to the Chickering the Dover School Committee because we're actually proposing some structural changes um, in, in terms of right now because students at Chickering do not have discrete you know computer science instruction as they do at Pine Hill so Dr. LaDuke has been working, we've worked it into the budget to make sure that the K through five comp sci computer science experience for kids in both elementary schools follows an authentic curriculum, a computer science curriculum, a code.org uh, modality, and that we're following that in both elementary schools so that when the kids naturally feed into sixth grade, that will tie in beautifully with our technology and engineering construct. So what we did is we, we took the time over the past couple weeks to, um, to put together this document, um, which is front and back, and it has both school logos and walks you through um, what a computer science experience looks like um, for kids in both of our elementary schools. So we, we thought it wouldn't it would be um, it wouldn't be correct to provide sort of the fine arts component to this without looking at the what is what does technology and engineering look like. Um, Hopefully there are enough. Thank you. Enough to go around. So we provide this for your for your review, consumption, um, and to ask questions about for sure. But when we looked at the cost allocation to shift gears a little bit um, in terms of going back to the fine arts position, if we were to base the cost allocation on the percentage of FTEs, the percentage of teachers. Total, total system-wide teachers. Uh, the percentage from Sherborne is 18% of the teachers that we employ are employed at Pine Hill, and this is where my finger is here under proposed. 21% of teachers are assigned to Chickering, and 61% of teachers at the region. When we did a cost allocation based on that, um, the apportionment for the portion rather for Pine Hill was $4,300, 4306.64. Um, which was a, a modest reduction from what we had been what we had looked at last month, which was in the neighborhood of you know fifty nine hundred dollars. So what it did for both elementary schools is brought it a little more in line with what the population of FTEs is globally, not the not the population of FTEs in fine arts necessarily, 
because keep in mind at some point I think the three school committees at some point will probably want to look at how a number of positions are report are allocated across the, the school system this may in fact be uh, some kind of a method that we may want to look at um, because especially for positions that are tied to instruction because it kind of logically ties the percentage of instruction where the percentage of teachers lie within the system so um, we offer this for your review I will share that the regional school committee um, had some additional questions it was about cost they were answered they had questions about the instruction they felt that the document that was provided was quite compelling in answering those questions and Judy Miller was there um, as well as Mary Jane Brenner Brown at the regional meeting last week and the regional school committee then voted unanimously in support of the complete reorg uh, or the reconfiguration that was not only for fine arts but also for the technology and engineering component at the region as well so at minimally the technology engineering is a go at the region because that's the one that's subject to regional school committee vote only because that touches their budgets only so that that technically isn't in isn't subject to Sherborne school committee or Dover school committees purview it's a 6 through 12 position but um, I share that that was the response well, if you Judy if you want to um, uh. I'm happy to answer questions I don't want to take up a lot of your time I do want to urge you to vote in favor of this because I think it's a real um, <coughs> um, enhancement um, to the instruction, to the fine and performing arts instruction at the Pine Hill School. Um, it currently, and Dr. Brown actually spoke much more eloquently than I did the last time because she talked, and I, and I used what you said, you're thinking, what did I say? <laughs> you, I, I said this to the region, you know, the people, the, the fine and performing arts teachers at Pine Hill are sort of a little island. They don't have peers here. Whereas, you know, at the middle and the high school, there are many more peers. And they, they don't have that subject matter uh, expertise here. And so what this position can do is support the curriculum. It can support evaluation. And it can, in, in some general sense, support those teachers and give them a greater sort of world view in terms of how they um, how they uh, you know will relate into the curriculum you know as a whole um, I it's it's difficult for me to speak in any way other than extraordinarily enthusiastically about how important um, music art and performing art education is in the schools not just for students to learn that, but for a host of other reasons, including um, just from a very simple level, students being able to sit still and be a part of an audience. Um, learning, um, you know, to work collaboratively on something in, in a way that you, that is different from being on a sports team. There are many, many, many functions that art and music and drama serve in the public schools that have nothing to do with art, music, or drama. I know this because I have two children who are very heavily um, in, in, involved in the arts um, and have been since they were at the Pine Hill School for many reasons other than art and drama. Um, I really urge you um, to um, vote in favor of this. It is a step toward excellence, which is what we are all um, looking for um, and striving toward in our community. Um, and it is, it's a first step in building something that's good and can be really excellent going forward. And I'm happy to answer questions if I can. I don't, I don't know. I actually don't think this is Really for you, Judy. I'm just, I, while you're talking, I was just thinking: Is this more about? Because I would think if there, are, if it's about the school and the education side, then it's what happens mostly during the school day, as opposed to the extracurricular. And it, it I, I know when I read the job description, there was discussion um, <coughs> over the months about this position having responsibility for art exhibition 
and for performance at this level, which would be, which might be extracurricular, or could be extracurricular. But again, I think, and Steve, I, you know, as, as I've said, I'm not hiring, <laughs> I'm not filling the job, okay? I'm not applying for the job, I have my own job. Um, but I think part of that is going to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, as, as the position develops, it will probably naturally become part of the, that, and there are a lot of things that can be done in order to promote the arts. So, yeah, I have absolutely. a really yeah. concrete example. The Choral Festival is this Thursday uh, evening, K through 12. Would it be grand if we could have some uh, visual art there too? Yeah. And that's what this director could do. We could connect the two, we could have some boards up, maybe show some of the three-dimensional pieces. You know, I would love to do that, but I just can't spread myself to figure out the navigating that. Um, could we have a little drama performance <coughs> at the time to capitalize? So that to me is, is using that evening performance to be able to highlight all of the arts. I think one of the, do thank you, Karen, <coughs> thank you, Judy. Um, I want to make sure you're still not on the clock, don't you? Um, one, of our, the, one of the Dover School Committee members said, you know, one of the things we realize in particular at Chickering is that the position is, is tantamount to an investment in a, in a long-term program. I found it interesting and it's accurate because a number of students upon entering high, middle school, and, and I will admit for, for various reasons, uh, exit the arts program. So when you look at, at the hundreds of kids involved in, um, in literally in, in the bands and band and chorus who, who do not continue at the, at the middle level, and there are various reasons uh, for that. Uh, some personnel issues we're working on, some, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And, um, and one of the reasons uh, that literally I assigned this year our choral director at the region, Jeff Herman, who's done a great job, he's new to us, I uh, made sure that he received that he was assigned both sections of chorus. So he teaches point two at middle school, point two at the high school. Why did I do that? So that he literally can work with the kids in middle school and there's a natural progression into the high school. There isn't this kind of I'm working with this person at the middle school and chorus and then it's kind of a fit and a stop, you know, before I'm gonna have to learn somebody else's way. You're building a program. So there was a real sentiment among some Dover School community members thinking, okay, maybe dollar for dollar it we don't we don't get next year, you know, the five thousand dollars worth worth of the position in a in a sort of empirical way. But there is definitely an <coughs> investment in the synthesis and the cohesion of that department um, that will afford a better experience for kids longitudinally. That was the be I, I think that was probably one of the best points that, that I've heard. I mean over time. Yeah. Uh, over the past seven or eight meetings. Any other questions from the committee? Yeah, I have one. It, it just seems like a, that we spent a lot of time on a $5,000 decision. And I think in general, it, it's a good thing. I, I'm just curious why technology wasn't a part of this as well. I mean, if that's part of what's happening at the region, there's nobody here pushing that or speaking up for that. And it seems like that would be it, you know, just as important in terms of where kids find right. an interest. No, it's a really good point. The, other, yep. the other, the main thing that I, I think it's a question I asked last time, and I don't think it's been answered unless I, unless I missed it, is, and, and this was very helpful, um, this scheduling expectations, is what changes about the school, about the kids' day, is in terms of extracurricular during the day, Especially with regard to next year, the year after, as these kids are taking, you know, I guess 30 minutes a day for Spanish. I'm not sure how that changes as we as we go by. There's just a lot going on, and I, I just I, I don't. And you don't have to answer this now. It's, it's just right. my concern. Right. It's what happens, and I guess you'd be the best person to ask. What happens? How does it change? Sort of what's what's happening now, and how does that change with this position? I, I don't. Yeah, it, it's, I don't it, understand. It, so it's not as if that. And certainly, jump in, Doctor. It's not as if all of a sudden um, during the school day there is a, a dedicated band block, or you know that that doesn't fall out of this this particular transaction. 
what this does is it allows the curriculum and the assessments and everything that underpins really the, the program that Kelly Hodge delivers at Pine Hill, it affords her an opportunity to work with a content expert in the way of a fine arts person who's going to bring Kelly together with the folks from Chickering and they're going to develop, what well, we've already have developed, they're going to refine the music experience for students at Pine Hill. Well, if there's, if there's a, a choral concert, K through 12, right? It seems like it's already happening. Not nearly in the, I mean, kudos to people. So I don't know, so that's what I'm saying. Yep. Yep. Right. And, and, and there are so many things that can be done with this position, okay? And what I, the way I see it beginning is that it will help Kelly Hodge, and I don't know who the art teacher there is, I'm so sorry, Sarah, 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 Sarah will help them to um, refine their curriculum. It will give them some additional, for lack of a better word, energy um, in, in that there will be a point person for this discipline within the district. It will, it, I, 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 and I get it, it would, it would help I guess it would help. I, I, when I read this, I think it's all, it's like 30,000 feet, it all sounds good. It would, it would help to hear from them just in terms of what's, what's going to change. It's a small amount of money relative to the whole budget, but there's still no, there's, there's still no specifics about what. I don't know what, yeah, I don't know what you're The difficulty with that change. is that it's a new position, that the person, that there's no incumbent in it. So the incumbent can't come to you and say, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Well, because the teachers that are, are going to be under that person, they can say, this is, this, is what we'll, this is how I see it happening. And these are the specific things that I see that I would be able to do that I can't do. I think that's in the document. It is. The instructional coaching as an enrichment coordinator pulling together all the meetings, having all the meetings as a curriculum leader. But, that's, um, but that, that doesn't, that, to me, and this is the last thing I'll yeah, say, yeah. that talks about, that doesn't say what's going to happen, what's going to change with the children and what activities that they yeah. do. So, yeah. Currently, it, it, they're, they're, we're looking at the ensemble curriculum, vocal and instrumental. And this person would have <coughs> that set of content eyes, K through 12, for us to look at that. I mean, it, I think we should pick a repertoire. I don't know what the repertoire looks like. I don't mm -hmm. know what that performance looks like, but the director of fine and performing arts does. And that's the difference that, um, you know, I can advise these people as best I can, but this person understands what it means to have an ensemble curriculum. That's one specific I know is going to okay. be an act. And, and it's likely to follow in this one time per week thing where music is one times per week and yes. art is one time? Yes. yes. That's what yes. it's going to yeah, There's yes. nothing structurally it will, that... that it, yeah, yep. it will enrich that experience for the kids. In addition to extracurricular. Yes. 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 Okay. And you were going to say? Um, I was just going to say, just quickly, I know that, for instance, um, I believe that the concert is not K through 12. Oh, it's three. It's, it's five through 12. Excuse it's me. Four. Isn't it third? Is it third? That's fifth grade here. No, this concert on Thursday, I believe, every other year it's been the elementary schools as well. But yeah, but I don't start more. Right. Oh, five. You're so right. So it's not a through So it's it's five. Five. So it's I just thought that through since through you said that seems to be already happening, yeah. it's not completely happening because it's not, of oh. course, isn't no. mm -hmm. it's five offered with the younger. I also was just thinking as you were talking about, I think that while the structure of the day may not changed so much. I know that, for instance, some years, like, of course, it's been mandatory. Some years it hasn't been mandatory um, at, at Pine Hill. You know, Chickering, you do take band, you don't take core. It's confusing. So I think that that's one of the things that may help, like, in the kids' actual day, <coughs> so that there's consistency that way. Um, and the other thing I was thinking is I know, having been on the CS, what is it, CSA board and finding, we'd bring in performers. A lot of times there's music. and. You know, I know at least when I was in the CSA, I'm not going to talk about those who are doing it now, but I, we would do it without any guidance. Be like, oh, we'd like, this looks cool. I would, I would hope that mm. this would be a person who went, they bring in right. these great performances <coughs> and great, you know, their in-house mentors, all sorts of things that that's with the, the guidance of an expert 
of which would make them even more valuable, tie them into right. the curriculum even better, rather than relying on parents who may or may not. And then you know, that's a, <laughs> it's a good point, Mrs. Harvey. And yet the other thing that, <coughs> that uh, Mr. Garland had asked was about the engineering. So we're in a really great but, but sometimes very complex you know, uh, school system. And what we're trying to move in the direction of in the 6 through 12 technology engineering, it is very likely that that will ultimately translate into something that connects logically with the elementary schools. Our first step in that process is to have that position rebranded in, in 6 through 12 for the time being. That presents an enormous amount of work at the moment because although the technology engineering people are on the same campus, there, there hasn't been at the, at the moment a lot of um, synthesis between those. So I honestly think, Greg, it's, it's the beginning of something very exciting. It's also something that we can look at from a fiscal perspective. So when the enrollments do de you know, decline at the, at the region, um, there's an opportunity to have discussion around this will have charted the course to be able to have a broader discussion around 6 through 12 or K through 12 curriculum leadership. You know, at the moment we have department chairs, and it's very, they're very isolated in, in the high school. And this is the beginning of something that it will probably be much broader uh, on a go forward basis. We just can't do it in one fell swoop. We're not regionalized yet. Yet. <laughs> Mary, we're not regionalized yet. <laughs> Frank? I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Frank, do you have something? So I, I was looking at the job description component, and it, it talks about that the uh, position would be uh, would teach 80 percent mm -hmm. of the courses. So that means 20 percent of the time they got a huge number of Why? other things to do. So my question was: Is this a um, a full year position, or is this a teaching year position? Teaching year position. So it it exactly mimics the department chair structure as currently exists at the high school. So. Um, and and when we thought of this, it's a really good question, Mr. Hook, that when we thought of this, it was you, you have an existing contract, you have to live within the four walls of a contract, as, as you know, and if the, the only position in our school system that has an evaluative capacity where the person can work in an evaluative way with teachers is a department chair. And as a result of that, and for a whole cadre of reasons, it made a lot of sense to plug this into that position curriculum leader, team leader, these other positions, they're not in that, in that jurisdiction. Um, so one of the things that has us concerned is that, you know, you, you look at Mr. Baruti, for instance, who chairs the math department at the high school, you know, Jim's department is, is nuclear. I mean, it's, it's insulated to the high school. Everyone's on the same floor. They're in the same part of the floor, right? This position is 20% is supervision for teachers that are across three other, you know, three campuses and four school buildings. So if anything really concerns me about it, it's looking at it, but but we've said this is it and it's 20% it's supervision and we're going to make do. So it's not like we would even have the wherewithal within the contract to, I wouldn't want people to think that, oh, next year this is then going to look like a 40% request for a release time and a 60% teaching time. There's nothing in the contract that allows for that. So. I wouldn't want the thing this is sort of a harbinger of things to come in that way, like, oh, we want to get this in, and then there'll be a greater allocation or a greater assignment for supervision and, and the coaching that, that is disallowed by way of our contract. Great question, though. Mary, you had a question? Uh, no. <laughs> I do not. Well, I do. Mary, you can't resist. I can't. I can't. Um, it, this is just, it's not a financial question. That's why I yep. hesitate. But um, I'm just wondering, in, in terms of, I hear talk of this person, you know, um, supervising, evaluating, and so mm -hmm. forth. It, sometimes it's phrased as the music component of it. Sometimes I've heard it phrased as the art component of it. Yeah. And I hear the assistant superintendent say, you know, I'm not the person to mm -hmm. do this evaluation. Right. Um, not evaluating, writing the curriculum. Well, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, but my, so my question is, um, how does someone whose background is in high school music right. evaluate a second grade painting teacher? 
Because the, yeah, that's a that's a good question, Mary. Um, so some of the people that would be in the in the pipeline and candidating for this actually hold what are called MFAs, uh, Masters in Fine Arts degrees. So their advanced training, that graduate course level work, um, affords them through that coursework to gain exposure. So that it's not as if I'm a, that person may well be a musician at heart, but that person has secured an advanced degree so that his or her jurisdiction extends beyond. Um, simply, and I, I don't mean to be pedantic, but, but in one particular content area. So right. that will be a requirement for some That it, yeah, we've written in the, the job requirements, you know, we want, to, we want graduate coursework, uh, ultimately an MFA would look great. I know that we, someone who's in the system has, has two master's degrees um, in the area, so we feel that those people would be eminently qualified. So somebody <coughs> that teaches art or right. music in the high school, <coughs> excuse me, Obviously, at, at some point, they've got to have a master's degree, but it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be in that area. Mm -hmm. in, in the, so it could be a, a equivalent time in, in anything, right? Not. It, it could be, but be, given the evaluation capacity, we, it, let's say, for instance, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we offer the position to somebody who has real strong background in the visual arts. Because there's an evaluation capacity, we can build into that um, and ensure the person actually secures some coursework in another area as well. Um, and we've actually done that with department chairs in the area of evaluation is to make sure they, um, that we inculcate the skills that are needed to really evaluate people, period. You know, like whether it's that content area or otherwise. <coughs> and Excuse I, have, me. I have supervised directors of fine performing arts in my previous position. And they certainly can navigate between the visual and the performing mm -hmm. arts and understand that content and give people appropriate feedback. So, so, so that, I mean, it seems like it suggests that, that Kelly and Sarah are not, we talk about experts in the field, uh, that they're not experts in the field. Mm, uh, so that. you could have any, any general teaching degree yeah. and teach art or music in elementary school. Mm -mm. No. 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 You have no. to be endorsed. Yes. In that particular in that subject context. area. In, yep. All elementary art education. You'd have to be endorsed. So it's not like you have a K through five license, I can go in and teach you know, science today and art tomorrow. But the person that in this position, this <coughs> proposed position, would have a, a deeper background than Kelly or Sarah? I wouldn't want to speak about personal people's individual credentials, but that, you know, it's a personnel matter. I wouldn't want to go there. But we could make sure if there was a candidate we were interested in that we said, you know, over the summer, you need to secure some additional coursework and 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 help the person to work or you know work through that. But yeah. any other discussion on this? This is a yes. In terms of certification, state certification. So someone to have this position, they still can't only teach either K through six or six through twelve. Mm -hmm because they only hold either elementary or secondary certification, is that correct? So certification levels, it's kind of an interesting question. Certification grade levels have changed over time. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me, so years ago you could have a, you know, a general teaching certification that allowed you to teach you know, anything, you know, grades K through eight. They've really refined that over time. So um, you know, my, my English teacher certification, for instance, is grades five through eight and, and eight through 12, or five through eight and nine through 12, you know, that particular certification. So I, as a holder of that license, could not go in and teach um, ELA in third grade. I'm not, I'm not licensed to, 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 to teach that, right? But some, some music. Did you wonder? <laughs> License to do K, go K through 12, that, I believe. That's correct, I yes. Yeah. yes. And I believe some art ones also go K through 12. Yes. So, depending on the background. You can apply for whatever you think you're qualified for, yeah. and then the DESE vets that. You can apply for the different, uh, if there is a certification, if there is a K2, 5, 6 through 8 being a right. second, 9 through 12 being a third, a individual can do all the work necessary, gain those certificates, take the test, get those certificates, prove their yeah. expertise, yeah. and then throughout the course of their Career. practicing, mm -hmm. they'll have to continue to go through what's needed to be able to recertify to be able to maintain those certifications. That's a good point. It's not for life. It's not like, you know, I hold this license, so 
you know, my middle school English, you have to do some coursework or teach in that. You have to use that license or improve that license to keep that license is fundamentally what has to happen in the process of recertification. Any other discussion? <clears throat> this is a vote. It actually, it looks like we should have a motion if people are in favor of it to improve the whole thing, but as far as the cost to approve the cost share by district based on FTE, otherwise if it changed 18.5% next year, we might have to vote it again or something like mm. that. So if we made it right. voted by uh, cost share by FTE share. You, you would you'd vote the position first and then the cost? Well, I, I think you can do it all at Vote once. it, just jumble it. Oh, I yeah. would package it. And say, yeah. 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 Well, uh, we could move that we accept the reconfiguration proposal as submitted by the superintendent with the cost share by district based on FTE. If I have to, yeah. That's acceptable. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Is that right? Four one? Is that yep. Okay. All right. Okay, so we have <coughs> Thank you, Judy. Thank you, thank you. So the two thousand sixteen operating budget. Superintendent. I feel like Greg wanted to sing a little song over here for us. <laughs> um, and, and do a dance. <laughs> and the drawing. Um, so on your, um, for the budget, uh, you received a, oh, and no, we have some, some goodies here for friends in the audience. We could just uh, one, two. You don't mind? Okay. This. So the um, what I have here is the this is the changes page that you had in your packet. There at the very bottom of the page um, where it says total advisory guidance, um, we wanted to make sure we adjusted. There was a percentage uh, issue at the bottom, so we want to make sure we adjust that. So I'm going to hand you right now a changes page that uh, we would like to draw your attention to as opposed to having you use um, and marry the okay. marry the version you have that was given to you on top this change pages right. replaces the one that's oh, in the paper okay. clipped version okay just for clarity <coughs> thank you change to the changes yeah it's an evolving <laughs> process so I think what may be helpful actually is to put the changes page because the changes page onto itself will make more sense if we flip through the talking, the revised talking points quickly. So um, I draw your attention to the talking points that you, you should have. I think I want to make sure school committee members have them right. There should be a, a little bit of red ink on them. So you'll notice red indicates it's revised for January 13th, 2015. Um, so if we can just fly through the items in red, that'd be great. So item four, um, we have not received much, this ties back to Mr. Hess's um, inquiry, much in the way of formal communication as to the proposed reductions. This is the governor's proposed reductions. As for circuit breaker reimbursement, thus far we have learned from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed that the extraordinary relief provision allowable under circuit breaker is most vulnerable. Um, extraordinary relief is, is not something that we've really been subject to in the past that essentially allows school districts to request additional uh, funding under circuit breaker um, for very extreme you know extra in extraordinary circumstances that typically is not something that we have we have sought necessarily and it often allows you to just be able to purpose and, and use circuit breaker money in sometimes in ways that wouldn't conventionally be allowed so that also isn't something that we've done so we know that there are some districts in except for instance some superintendents who said well I'm really depending on some of this extraordinary relief to relieve the district of some um, 
some exorbitant special ed costs and, and there was a lot of clarity offered at the accept meeting saying that's not necessarily what you're able to do you know don't sort of go to the bank with that um, as a funding mechanism to offset it's not just because you had an extraordinarily expensive year in special ed that doesn't allow you to go to the go to the well um, there's anything more on that Terry on extraordinary relief um, extraordinary relief is, is really for, for districts who have encountered something during school So yes, it allows districts who have experienced some kind of um, cost that, that was not anticipated um, much beyond um, what Circuit Breaker typically covers. Um, and it actually, it, th there's a formula that works with it. We have not ever qualified for that. So, so it, on, it would on, not likely affect us. On talking point number 11, this concerns uh, some of the English language learner. Um, information there. I won't read through all this, but we wanted to provide some information about ELL cases and caseloads um, in the buildings. It's really important with ELL to remember that um, you may you may have four students who are ELLs in the building, uh, but who come in who are non-English speaking, requiring up to three hours per day of of actual uh, tutoring and, and sheltered English instruction and that of direct services and that can really be a compelling factor in your your budget so you can't just say oh well a couple of years ago we had 40 ELL students or something and now we have 26 isn't that great not not necessarily if, if the 26 students some of them are new and some of them are scoring at the beginning level when they enter the school system and historically it's important to know we have not really met the requirement we've put and as a cost saving measure we actually have a teacher, an ELL teacher director, and then we have ELL tutors who, who work with that person in developing the plans and in executing the plans. So that has been something that has helped us over time because you remember our ELL population really spiked a few years ago. Um, when I started six years ago, we had four students, and two years ago we had 43 students, um, many of whom come to us um, at the beginner level. So that's... Um, item 13, item 15 rather, is um, speaks to the whole notion of the retirement, this, this $5,000 placeholder, and you'll recall that contractually we would have $5,000 times five educators for a placeholder of $25,000. You'll see a change to that on the, on the changes page when we get to that. But there was some discussion um, offline over the past few weeks about if there was any desire to create a reserve account at the town level where funds could be kept in a reserve account and if needed in a given year that is to say if a if a teacher announced retirement and we needed to tap that reserve fund uh, that that could be done but that that reserve fund would have to be set up through town meeting uh, in order to do that that's in fact what Dover does with and perhaps Sherborne but I know in speaking with uh, town administrator Ramsey and Dover that's what they do with uh, like police sick time buyback provision there's a reserve fund and if it <coughs> needs if they need those funds to meet a particular need it's it's dispensed from that account as opposed to being a placeholder in one's operating budget so I am sure we will talk a little bit more about that tonight um, it continued on the next page we actually provide a little bit of, of the longevity census data um, so for this year and for next year for Pine Hill School uh, the number of FTEs the number of FTEs this year who are receiving any form of longevity uh, being nine educators the number of those educators who are receiving three thousand dollars so they're in some year of the three thousand dollar payment recall in the old contract you could do three thousand three thousand three thousand and then when the new contract was rolled in um, people had like 10 days to notify us of whether they were going to you know elect to stay on that kind of platform if they were going to you know go to a five thousand dollar platform even if someone went to the five thousand dollar platform it's netted what's netted out of there is any other applicable longevity payments for a particular year so that's that's important and we've noted here that at this time we have no confirmed retirements from pine hill uh for next year um 
we've received some no retirement notifications from the other districts, but not uh, uh, actually just from Dover, just from Chickering at the moment. Um, so we've provided the longevity census data uh, for next year. So interesting enough, for next year, we'll have 13 educators receiving any form of longevity. That could be the 500 or whatever the benchmarks are for longevity. Uh, we will have one person uh, collecting the $3,000, and I do believe that is the person's last year of that $3,000, I think, for next year. <coughs> I know, trying to remember the districts, it's like testing the memory. Um, can can yep. you clarify or refresh my memory on the, the, the timing? I, is it uh, they request the, well, now it's the same in terms of saying I'm going to retire and then and requesting. Feb February 1. That's, that's the time frame. They have to do it by February. Yeah, yeah. so we just, um, we, you know, we just received notification of a teacher from Chickering uh, the other day. Mary? Yeah, I just have a, a clarification that I'd like to ask Frank this question, right. um, and I got a different answer from him than what right. I get from that, which is the, the people who, um, my original question was the, the people who have qualified for and received the $9,000 yep. total, okay, were they eligible for the um, the new five thousand dollar award and Frank had said that they were uh, not I, eligible. No. But no. you are no. saying this so this is what I'm trying to clear up. So right. now it no. sounds like only the people who are in the midst of receiving it are exactly. not eligible. That's correct. But somebody who has already received the nine thousand, they are eligible for the five thousand? No. No. Okay. No, absolutely not. Okay. And and what I meant about netting out Mary is Let's say you are in that final year, and you you know you have a you haven't announced anything, and you're eligible for a thousand dollar one jump. Yeah, like no, one I, of the, I understood you that. got that, yeah. That and someone says I'm leaving. Well, you yeah. might get four thousand to bring you to five. Yeah, um, exactly. One individual. Oh, that individual who's receiving the three thousand dollars. Okay, so that's a clarification. So that one educator at Pine Hill will have the payment this year. 16 and 17 that person decided to stay on the 333 system but that they were eligible for that it's also important to remember that retirement retirement under MTRS and what we consider you know retirement are, can be two different things I mean I think we often think that people work until they'll get to that 80 percent kind of thing someone can retire before getting to the 80 percent and by virtue of our contract <coughs> the year breakdown someone can work the number of years to get the five thousand dollars that doesn't mean I think it's 20 years that doesn't mean that the person's eligible therefore by MTRS to earn to 80 percent of his or her retirement for for life that just means the person's hit 20 years once out maybe the person's going to change careers or something like that and the person's eligible for the five thousand dollars the whole notion underpinning that in the contract was that higher paid folks seeking to leave to be somewhat incentivized to leave, which saves on the budget end of things because they're typically your higher earners, right? Um, so number 20, um, the proposed budget calls for the, the, this was the guidance council issue and at your December 9th meeting, there was a, there was a decision to reinstate that. So we've highlighted that in red, that's sort of old news. Um, item number 23, um, speaks to the fine arts department chair position which we just acted upon item 24 um, this you'll see in the changes page that uh, we feel is that we feel comfortable as we did with the region in reducing the um, the high water mark for the for the transportation bid uh, the bid opening is January the 30th so we did this with the region last Tuesday night on the region's changes page. It dropped the amount that was allocated for uh, transportation by a percentage. We've dropped the same percentage for Pine Hills budget, and we'll do the same thing next week for, for Dover. Uh, yes. Yeah, and that, and that's all, this is also a clarification. Where it's um, in the talking point there, it's written as, as if it's two different statements but my question is, is the 4384 the result of going to one less bus, or is no. that, and if we go to one less bus, will that 
possibly have a further impact or not? Or yeah, you talk about it could. That? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And that, that's a good point. We talked a little bit about that. Mary, did we talk about that at the region Re meeting? Oh, the number? yeah, but yeah. that was such a it was such a long time, <coughs> seven <laughs> days ago. Um, if it was worlds ago. We did. We talked a little bit about the structure of that, and we do feel confident, uh, Ms. Tague. What's so that? that they are not the region's not losing a bus. We still need all 19 buses at the region, but the whole notion with this new RFP was um, that we could probably do without one, with one fewer bus, bus at each elementary school, uh, for sure. Is Both. this contract? Mean they have to buy new buses at the beginning of the contract, or or, or that has nothing to do with it? I don't think the buses, so. Um, the buses can't be more than um, I believe four years old. Yeah. Okay. Three or so four. if a new provider were to come in, they'd provide us with a list of new models. Come in and Okay. Um, so on item number twenty-eight, uh, this speaks to. Uh, special ed costs and in red down the bottom the budget changes presented uh, to the Sherborne School Committee on January 13th reflect an overall reduction a reduction of hundred and five thousand nine hundred ninety seven dollars in Pine Hill OOD expenses based on updated information and the budget changes page uh, presented to you this evening reflects a net reduction of four thousand two hundred eleven dollars in regional out of district expenses there so it's almost a hundred and ten thousand dollars in expense uh, reductions there and as as um, dr. LaDuke referenced a, a bit ago the uh, POS management system for the food service component of our school system uh, you'll recall from the advocate report there were all kinds of concerns around uh, the sustainability of the management system that we're using its reliability it's not being windows based um, the fact that it doesn't allow in accurate inventory control doesn't allow for accurate financial reporting the whole cadre of, of issues um, illuminated through that report so we went out with miss madden and, and looked for a pos system and there's a, a system that we're particularly interested in it's used by almost every district around this area and nationally called NutriKids. and it actually allows you to submit allows miss madden to submit menus and it will sort of give you an analysis of the you know the the uh, nutritional value the nutritional integrity of menus it will allow for real-time inventory control uh, across our campuses it's a it's a wonderful platform it will come at a cost pr with a price tag about ten thousand dollars uh, for that <coughs> for pine hill chickering and a twenty thousand dollar placeholder for the region so your changes page captures that we wouldn't have known that until we've only learned that right over the holiday break mm -hmm. I think is when we learned uh, the cost so I feel like I'm gonna sneeze um, but we'll, we'll keep going um, so if we can bring you to the changes page um, on the, the column everything appearing in red what you will notice is the um, if following the chain literally the change column the teachers retirement um, Remember, we had a fifty. We had a fifty. Yeah, we had a twenty-five thousand dollars placeholder for this budget. We've reduced that by fifteen, and I think Mary will might have something to say on that particular point. We'll see. Um, regular transportation has come down forty-three eighty-four. We just spoke about that. The fine arts department chair position came down from the original proposal by sixteen hundred seventy-five dollars. We just spoke about the hundred one thousand, the the hundred five thousand dollars rather in reductions in total um, special education costs for related to Pine Hill age <coughs> students, and we also talked about the reduction in um, the regional out of district um, special education costs as well. So, in total, then the total revised Pine Hill budget came down from your last presentation by. A hundred and forty eight thousand five hundred and forty seven dollars uh, or negative two point two percent or negative three point six five percent from guidance Mary. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just looking at these two sheets and the numbers are all the same but the percentage is different yeah. right because the formula in the last cell the, the cell it, right. it was three point seven nine in the first one it okay, should be so there's, there's no change it's no. just okay right we were just checking on you are. Mm -hmm. Did you carry it out to more decimal points? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so, 
you know, we, we really feel like administration, and thank you to the business office and to the special education office for uh, working with the leadership team over the past month. I mean, this is a, this is a wonderful budget um, in, in a way um, because it, it certainly, we think, is commensurate with where the enrollment of the school is. It, it reflects so much work and so much real careful analysis to make sure that we're presenting to you and to the town of Sherbourne an accurate picture of, of what's needed uh, to, to an accurate picture of what's needed to run uh, the school next year and kudos I think to, to the business office and to the admin team mr. Huck? so and just articulating this point last year we came in below the advisory number right. by a certain large percentage. I don't remember what that is right now right. off the top of my head. That was seven days was eons ago yep. last yeah. year. Um, but we came in quite substantially lower. And this year we're again 3.65% below last year's times whatever we were allowed to increase by. So we're, we're still coming in at a very low uh, number. So. It, you know, it, it reflects, I mean, particular, it is. And when you look at looking at every line in the budget and really there, I mean, the one caution here is that there's, there's just not a lot. It's a very lean budget. I know we say that, it seems like every year, but um, this of all three districts is, is, is the leanest. But when you look at what trying to move the needle instructionally, fine arts position, trying to preserve our curriculum <coughs> supervisors, et cetera, to preserve and to protect some things, but when you look at special education and the work of the out of district coordinator Terry Marla, just really looking at every case and can we meet the needs of a student in district and can we look at another option that meets students' needs but is a is a more cost effective placement? That's where all this comes. That's where some of this comes from, and some of it occurs because naturally kids move to the region or, or kids move out of district or or other things happen, but. Um, this is constant scrubbing of, of what's best for kids always and then what's responsible by our town. I think as, as far as uh, the, uh, the $25,000, which is now $10,000 for the possibly retiring teachers, right. that if, you know, advisory, someone could come up with some wording or some method, then we could adjust that in the future. I think as it is, we should leave it in there and then if you come up with something solid that well, would would be on the, on the town meeting floor and, and perhaps on the town meeting floor would come up for our budget so we would know how it would work. Well, here's our sort of position on, yeah. the, on the whole thing. Um, advisory feels that while as long as the retirement awards are built in to the budget at whatever level, whether it's at twenty thousand or fifty thousand or whatever, it um, it obscures the actual cost of running the schools because, for example, the um, ten thousand of the fifteen thousand that is out of here. Now. In other words, we used to have a twenty-five thousand dollar right. item in there. Okay, that's now down to ten thousand. Okay, but ten of that fifteen thousand has been reappropriated to the the point of sale to the um, cafeteria food. No, service. not really. I yes, mean, really. No, I mean, it th th those are the, the other costs that we have to it have. Wasn't, it wasn't there before. I know, but it's, it's a new it's cost that we need. Well. But so you're not switching one for the other. It wasn't like we took this, we take that. It we would still need the point of sale whether you had it in there or not. That's exactly what happened because you can't. You voted the the number on the budget, which was its maximum, at a fifty thousand dollar appropriation for um, the retirements, and now you so you can't add to that. We, we did, we're not adding okay. it to it. We've already cut a hundred thousand dollars. I know. No, no. Today. No, I know. But the, so, but the $10,000, okay, what, what advisory would like to do is take every year, not have the 
a uh, retirement award as part of the operating budget. <coughs> so that when it comes time to pay those awards, okay, it's that money, well, at the region right. specifically, that was that happened. The thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars came off the region's um, retirement line and was and was transferred to other items. Okay, and it appears that they were the same items that are here. <coughs> so, excuse me. <coughs> so, advisory wants to see that highly variable, but upfront appropriation out of the operating budget. So we would like to see it funded with an article that is funded and then the, well, some people on advisory don't want funded at all. I mentioned this at the region. Um, they feel that it should be simply paid because there's no requirement to fund it. There's only requirement to pay it. You understand uh, what I, the difference yeah, can, so There is no difference. So <laughs> if you're going to pay it, you have to well, fund it. Well, there are turn backs every year, and so it could be paid from the turn backs. I mean, you've got, in particular, this year, you know, there's a very large one. But that might not be true every year. But if it's taken out of the operating budget as such and is treated as an article, funded, that's where you go for that money, then that's, it's never an operating. Right, well I'm not sure what the feeling of the rest of the people are, but that's what I said, if you have that vehicle, right. then I for one would be willing to, to look in that direction, right? I was going to say, uh, can, can the details of this discussion, can, can they be had someplace other than here? I mean, I understand it's an important point, but I've had the discussion with a number of people, and, and to me it, it's, it's pretty, I'm not going to say it's obscure, but, but, it, it, but it's more about municipal accounting than it is about the school's budget. But we, we effectively, I would argue, uh, the negotiation team s enhanced the contract. It was a positive change to the contract. The, this other is, is more how it's accounted for. If it's a revolving front, it goes back to free cash things like that I, I would just suggest that that this discussion could go on for a long time and and to do maybe <coughs> to have it offline in terms of how to how to handle it right well right. My, my proposal would be that you know we pass the budget as listed and then once the wording comes up and you you show us what you're going to do then we could reduce it yeah. next month or, yeah. or, or whenever it happens to be I don't have a problem with that but I'd like to see the wording and how it's how but it's going to it lay would out. have to be it would have to be reviewed too in terms of the the, the language in the contract. If if it's something that has to be voted every year, I'm not sure that would that would satisfy the contract. But nonetheless, can, can I'm assuming you've had this? Can we? Can this be? Can can you and Mary and Steve and right and, and then the town council remember? would have to take a look at you know, the type of vehicle because it couldn't be like a regular revolving account because that would have to be money from outside the system. It would be, it would be reserved. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, any, any other discussion on, on the budget itself? In fact, Chris just reminded me that she said, you know, in, in her past uh, lives, she has written this article for others, for other districts for the same yeah. kind of, so if it would be okay, Chris wouldn't mind taking a stab at writing, writing some proposed article language and then we'll Share put sure. the ball at play. And then we'll take it from there. It's it's a, actually a little cleaner in Dover and Sherwin. It, it gets a little muddier at the region. Yeah, because um, obviously yeah. more teachers, more some more um, visibility and vulnerability <coughs> around the topic, um, and no no avenue other than through the budget or E and D uh, to fund it. You know? Yeah, exactly. Thank you, thank you, thank you ladies. Okay, so um, any other discussion? So we have the, the budget. Final number of six million five hundred ninety-seven thousand nine hundred twenty-three dollars. Is that correct, Mr. Bliss? Yes. Yes. What's the what's the number again? Six million five nine seven nine two three. Yeah. Correct. 
Do you need a motion? Yes. Uh, I move we approve the revised budget for two, for FY16, <coughs> the amount of six million five ninety seven nine twenty three. Any second? No second. Any discussion? Any all those in favor? Opposed? Okay. I have, Frank, I have one question yes. for Mr. Bliss. Um, yes. Having gone through this for two years, yes. I think we first saw the budget at the beginning of November, maybe? Yeah. It seems like a lot of things change. I'm just wondering if it would be easier for you guys next year to wait until December, or do you like throwing it out there and discussing it over a it couple minutes. I won't be here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever we want, right? Yeah, she's uh, October. Uh, it, yeah, I, I think let's let's see how the appointment process rolls out, et cetera. There is something nice about having the holidays hit, and we know our budgets are out the door, yeah. and we've done a lot of the heavy lifting, so then it's kind of massaging it. I think it helps advisory. It, it, we've gotten into the habit through Sherman School Committee of delivering before uh, Thanksgiving. In this so. way, we can be making a lot of changes like at this meeting rather than the February meeting, which gets rather close to the right. process. Right. You know, I don't know. We can see how it goes. Yeah. Um, Thank you for suggesting. Okay. So next uh, we have for discussion uh, except classroom lease for next year. Sure. So there was nothing that was supposed to be included in your packet. I, I probably should have said that in the report. Um, as you know, last year um, the decision was made to <coughs> enter into two leases, one with the Tech Collaborative, the other one with Tech, one with the Accept Collaborative. And um, we have learned that the Accept Collaborative really would, would be interested in yet another classroom. We do not have another classroom um, to really be able to provide. So we just want to update the committee and let you know that they've asked for more classroom space. We don't have more classroom space. Uh, so there is a chance that knowing that, except May, if all of their other programs remain situated where they are, um, if they are in fact in need of more classroom space, that the program may ultimately move. vacate Pine Hill, which would be fine with us sort of from a space utilization um, issue. We do have a number of folks, uh, providers and for special education who are moving a lot of equipment around and from, from room to room and area of uh, different parts of the building to deliver those services and, and they'll continue to do that um, but we certainly don't have you know another classroom uh, to be able to provide so uh, except and tech are interested in renewing their leases and except would, would like more space we don't really have that so ultimately they may vacate um, and we just wanted to apprise you of that. This is the time of year when they put out a survey to us and ask us whatnot. And as Ms. Green has alluded to a few different times, you know, it's very disruptive to the families of kids who are in the programs <laughs> when, you know, your child may this year be in Pine Hill School in Sherborne, but if that program leaves and it's all of a sudden at the XYZ School in, Sher in Ashland or something, um, that's where they try to have like kind of a state put where, you know, you'll be able to stay in a particular building um, because you could theoretically have parents who say, you know, no, I'm, you know, I don't really want my child in, you know, in a building in Framingham. I thought that it was the deal was that the child would be in Pine Hill. So it would be nice if, if in a way, if their program weren't expanding and they just needed the one room, but they need more space. Okay, so we'll be updated. As yes, as well. so we have we have some kids in that in that classroom, right? So that's a potential. We have bump in. We're affected by that program. Yeah. Okay, so uh, next in our agenda, then. Me, our, Frank, yes. I had been meaning to ask this for months, and I keep forgetting. <coughs> the, the money that we get from leasing the classroom, does where does that go? Does that go to. Right. Pine, no. <laughs> Remember when I was in Hawaii last yeah, night? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just mad because I didn't get to go. I wish I were. So we'll, we'll go together next time. Does, um, does it, so does that go to um, directly to the town? Does it go to the town through the school? Yeah, does she, it go yeah. to the whole region? Where does that money go? So that goes in that it, when I met with Mr. Caruso at the time when he was chairing the Sherwin Board of Selectmen, he wanted that to go into the revolving fund for Pine Hill into the building rental fund um, okay. to be used for smaller kinds of capital things that may come up 
that uh, and the committee has decided uh, this year that some of those funds were to be used out of that account for a couple of different reasons. Um, one that was handled through executive session and whatnot. So, yep, okay. yep. So that's where it goes. And, and, and do we, at some point, do we get a, an accounting sort of of the revenues? The lease was the seven, lease, it's seven thousand dollars per classroom, so it's fourteen thousand dollars in revenue. No, I mean I actually yep. knew how much it was, but yep. um, we get at the region we get revenue statements. Well, we don't. But we don't have any. It's at the town level. Yeah. The okay. town handles that for us. Okay. For okay. this committee. So, yep. All right. So you, it's just comes to the town and yep. goes to this fund. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. By the way, these are, um, since I have one, um, the things that you gave out tonight were terrific. The, um, the staffing and the, um, uh, this thing here on the, on the SPED, on the staffing enrollment, and in particular, the description, I guess it was from um, Dr. Brown, the, um, how the curriculum is laid out during the day and how many sections there were on everything. That was great. Thank you. Just we, great. we aim to please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, uh, for your review, you have the, uh, the Dover Sherbin minutes, the Dover minutes, and there's a note. A little reminder for some of us, I guess, about the town report due by January 23rd. Um, also, um, oh, excuse me, right. Uh, we still have our minutes, our Sherbin minutes you're about to do. Okay, so we have the Sherbin School Committee minutes from December 9th. Um, any corrections, additions? I move that we accept the minutes of um, December the 9th, 2014. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. So now we, we wait, just, wait, wait, wait. I, I have yep. to abstain because I wasn't here. Okay. Just have to note that. So, Thank you. Or, or nothing. <laughs> so um, next we just have to review those minutes at our leisure. And um, the items for the February school committee meeting. Now that's when we're going to do the, uh, the language. Yeah, that's really a flesh. That'll be a lot, a lot of it. And, okay. Um, and then we'll hope to provide, through Dr. Brown's report, maybe the little um, synopsis of the school day and, and a little more information on that. Might help to fill in some of the blanks with the FLUS presentation, too. Mm -hmm. And then I think Mr. Hess, uh, we'll just look with Mrs. Hovey maybe at what, we can always look back at what we did last February, you know? Mm -hmm. We can look back to the agenda to see if there was anything that we're not thinking of. Very good. Didn't Thanks. we meet at the Sherburn Inn last February? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's closed. It's closed. That was, I know. Yeah. Well, we could, <laughs> so if there's anything else you can think of, you can let me know if you want it on the agenda. Although we probably want to have it fairly short. It's going to be the, the plus. Right yeah. Now. Will it be a joint agenda? Like it's their no. meeting to, it's our meeting, they're coming to it? Right. They'll oh. post that they're meeting here because they'll be convened as a group, yeah. but there won't be any decision making on their part, obviously, for okay. February. But. So it's our meeting and they're coming. Well, we should make note of that for, for Pat as well for the uh, televising that uh, maybe for the February meeting, we might want to think and strategize a little bit about seating for, for our friends from Dover. How many? Well, there are five of them. Yeah. So um, we should be able, we'll be cozy, but it'll work. I think if we just talk people at the ends, maybe. Thanks, Pat. Okay, so. Having so the screen, people have to move over anyway, right? We'd have so. to move out anyway, yeah. yeah. Okay, at this time I'd like to make a motion to go in executive session because of uh, for security um, concerns and not concerns, conser considerations. <laughs> and the, uh, the superintendent had a meeting yesterday, so that's why we did not have time for the safety <coughs> official to uh, post this before. So in accordance with Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Part 4, which is to discuss the deployment of security personnel or devices or strategies, strategies with respect there too, would like us to go into executive session. Does someone want to second that motion? Second. Okay. Uh, so is it by poll? Yes. And Frank, yes. Yes. Frank, yes. Craig, yes. Thank you very much. We're adjourned to uh, recess to executive session.